Welcome to The Driven Entrepreneur, where we sit down with visionaries, trailblazers, and entrepreneurs and discover why and how they do what they do. We'll get the backstory, plus plenty of life and business lessons along the way. Here's your host, Matt Browning. Hello, hello, welcome back to The Driven Entrepreneur. It's Matt Browning hanging out with you. Man, you're finishing a big week, or maybe I don't know when you're listening to this, if you're listening on demand, of course, to The Driven Entrepreneur, where you can get it also on demand, not just on the radio in your car. You can get this for your treadmill. You can get it for your couch. You can get it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, wherever you get your on-demand podcast shows. Grab it. You can even check it out on YouTube, of course. It's always at Matt Browning, so make sure you follow me at Matt Browning, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube to get this on demand, get some past episodes. But hey, let's jump into this week's episode. This week's episode, I have another driven entrepreneur, and this is a story that I don't get nearly as often. This is an entrepreneur that was driven out of homelessness into starting a business at a very, very young age. Um... She started her first business at 16 to support herself because she was abandoned by her single mother and left homeless. With now 30 years of experience, she dedicates herself and her life to passionately supporting other small business owners who maybe have had a similar struggle but a different story or not struggling but just wanting to achieve their dreams and specializing. uh, She specializes in customized financial strategies and business development, financial uh, strategic planning. She's also worked with multi-billion dollar companies, companies like Monster Beverage, uh, World Bank, uh, National Science Foundation, Hollywood producers, musicians, plus several hundred small businesses that you may not have heard of but are making waves in the world. She's also been a featured speaker at the Best You Expo with Les Brown. Welcome to the show, Andy Monet. How are you? Happy, happy days, Matt. I am doing great. Well, you're in in sunny Southern California, and as we record this, it is springtime. Is it warm enough for you? Oh, gosh. I feel like every day is a wonderful day. California or not. For you, yeah. 72 and sunny every day. Does it get boring? Does it get boring out there with the weather? Oh, absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) You got to come. We're recording this uh, from, uh, from my little budget studio in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where we get four seasons. It's winter. Um, pre-winter, post-winter, and summer. So it's an exciting time. But hey, let's talk about you. Um, You have have one of the most interesting stories that I've heard in a while. Um, Growing up with a single mom, and you, I mean, it's no no secret, you share this right in your bio and on your website, andymonet.com, biz.com. And really about your single mom abandoning you. So how long was your mom a single mom? Um, And what had happened there? Was it dad left? Was it a divorce? Was it a death? What was it like growing up for those first, you know, I guess 16 years? What was, what's family like? What's finance like? What's the world like to you? Oh my goodness. Yes. Well, it, it was sadly kind of tragic the whole time. I mean, I remember at, by the age of five years old, I was already, my mother told me, okay, you're five, you're starting school. You know, it's your responsibility to take care of yourself, get dressed, make your lunch, walk to school and basically be an adult at five. And, you know, when you're a child, you don't know any better, right? What was the circumstance? Why is that happening? Is your mom trying to get your responsibility? Is she working two jobs or is there dysfunction? Like what's going on? Well, mom was bipolar, which doesn't help. And the single mom, so she was working all the time, day and night. And she just, you know, you only have so many hours in a day, right? And if you're trying to survive in the early 70s with the, you know, gas crisis and just, you know, the we had there was a lot of um, uh, financial issues at the time. So she was just gone all the time, but not, you know, not because she necessarily wanted to, right? You just have to work and you have to pay your bills and you don't want to be homeless. And after so many years of that, I think uh, she just had had enough. And I think the combination with the bipolar issues and the single mom, you know, she was young when she had me and, and, you know, we all, I think, especially with women, there's always the, the love connection with is is equals value, right? Your stability or financial stability or emotional stability or all those things that happen, but um, it just, you know, it adds up. And one day she, that was it. She was done. And there were signs, you know, leading up to it, but I, you know, at a young age, you don't recognize them. 
as you do now looking back? Sure, sure. Gosh, I, I, that must have been so hard. Um, when you were like 14, 15, 16, the kind of couple years leading up to this, what is, you know, junior high and, and your freshman year like? Are you pretty much like independent and taking care of yourself at this point? Or was it getting worse before? Tell me kind of how that led up to, you know, this huge life-changing moment. Well, you know, I would like to say things were relatively normal, but it kind of wasn't. I mean, I had gone through nine schools between first grade and high school, and we were always moving. I didn't have friends. I was, you know, I mean, being a teenager is already rough, right? But then add new schools and no friends and you know it's difficult to it's difficult to get new friends in general but um when i you know the few years leading up to it i had my mom had given me away to my aunt and that was tragic and difficult what what did that look like what was it driving up and saying here you're living here now absolutely really everything was a shock every I had no stability you know I didn't know where I would be sleeping at night in the sense of like we had a home but my mom if she was either working or she wanted to play she was young and so you know if she saw a friend on the street at the coffee shop she would say oh and you know she's gonna go you're gonna spend the night at her house tonight so she can go out and play and so like I wasn't homeless at that point but I felt homeless because I just didn't know where I was going to be at night and um, then there were some which I don't know if it's appropriate to mention but then there you know she left me at a man's house and then I had you know a, a a mol- molestation issue oh, and gosh. I mean it was just like you name it I'm I've done it I mean it's just it just is and so we had that and then one day she woke up and she drove me to my aunt's house which was several hours away and she left me there and she's like all right you're gonna live here now and so there's just a lot of pain associated that was it with being you're gonna live just, here now yeah and you know if my mom doesn't love me who's gonna love me right? That's kind of where I come, I came from. Right. And then when, you know, it was just, even though my mom was just had so many challenges, I still, she was still my mother and I still wanted to live with her. So long, long, and again, long story short is my aunt said, okay, she needs to go back to live with you. This is your daughter. You need to figure it out. And so I went to a, um, uh, live in counseling for teenagers and the counselors are like, why are you even here? <laughs> like, not, you're not a troublemaker. You have straight A's in school. You, you, you know, you're emotionally stable. Like we have no idea why you're here, but you have to be here because that's the program that you're in. And then I went from there to live back with my mom but it, by that time, it was like, like less than a few months later, and she was just was done, done. So, I mean, there's a lot of stories. Now, did your mom of... did your mom like take off at that point, or did you? Because usually, the people that I and I'm unfortunately or fortunately maybe right because of the the positivity that can come out of such a terrible and hard thing. And I think you're certainly one of the people that does that, right? That I know you've made you've made huge positive strides as a result. Um, the Phoenix rose from the ashes. The Phoenix didn't mm-hmm. rise from rainbows, you know, and you're, you're one of those people, which I'm so proud of you for. It's amazing. Um, a lot of times the story is it got so bad at home for abuse or trauma or whatever the situation was that at 16, I took off. Now it sounds like you, was it the opposite? Did you take off or did one day tell me kind of, and we'll move on from here, but you know, tell us how kind of the final weight came down did your mom pull you aside in the kitchen and say okay um pack your bags or did she move city like how how did it turn out that now you all of a sudden you're on the streets it was i laugh because it's just when i talk about it it just sounds so bizarre but i remember the day vividly still years later and you know i was miserable i was i was living my room was the living room so I was sleeping on the couch and it really wasn't my room it was just where I slept you know I didn't have a place of my own as a teenager which you know boo hoo hoo so what and um I got home I would walk to school which was not far but it was at that particular time in my life we lived in a really crappy area so I always was felt for my life I mean I nothing ever happened but I was just I was terrified every single time I left the house to walk to school 
there were not good people hanging around and, and you have these 30, 40, 50 year old men, you know, woohooing you walking by and I'm a tiny little girl. I mean, I'm barely five one. And so it's just terrifying. And then I come home I, and I get straight A's. Thankfully was one of my saving graces. Academics was really easy for me. I'd go home and I'd sleep at, at that time. So I'm a teenager. I come home and I sleep. And my mom was like, well, you must be on drugs, which I wasn't. And she is, it was just one of her bad days because she's either yelling or asleep. So this was a yelling moment with the bipolar issues. She pulls me by my hair off the couch and um, throws me out of the front door and says, go figure it out because I'm tired of being your mom and I'm tired of trying to take care of you and all the other craziness that she says, which of course doesn't make any sense because I, you know, I'm going to school, getting good grades and, and that's that. But um, I lived on the street for about a week, uh, literally. And then her boyfriend at the time says, convinced her to come talk to me. So she let me back into the house and she was super judgmental and doing the stare down thing that she does and she's like you know basically what and I'm like thinking well you know what I want to move back in she says no and she's and then she decides okay well why don't you spend the night one night and we'll figure it out and I'll decide tomorrow and then the next day she was gone like literally gone so it wasn't her place anyway she was sharing it with her boyfriend so her boyfriend was there and the roommate was there and I was on the couch and she was gone oh my gosh and she didn't even say goodbye she just was gone the next day? She was gone, gone, gone. And um, and they didn't want me to stay there. This, you know, 16-year-old girl in a two-bachelor bedroom apartment, right? Oh, I mean, that's so, all sorts of not a good idea. Yeah, in, in so many ways, right? And luckily, nothing happened, but still not a good situation. So they're like, you know, we're not your parents. Go, fi you know, bye. So, you know, that homelessness you know I lived in laundromats and underneath the deck at the at that actually was a condo on the water <laughs> again boo hoo hoo but <laughs> so you know underneath the deck just random places looking for bushes that was going to be safe where I wouldn't where I actually could sleep and not be worried about people coming to get me because the whole world is terrifying at that point still and I mean you know, I'm 41 year old male it would be terrifying if I had to do that right now I can't begin to imagine yeah it was it was you know lots of things and you know the 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 weird other part about it kind of changed the direction just for a moment is that like this was that was not my first time being homeless. That's the thing. And, you know, I was homeless at least a few other times, once from leaving an abusive marriage and um, another time from when I was in college, when my roommate, um, it's a funny story, but sad is that he thought I stole his checks, but I didn't. And I only say that because he's like, if this is what happened, you don't live here anymore, which I would totally support that coming from his side, but that's not what happened. And we never figured that out. But anyway, so, you know, I'm, there's, I, I, I still have a little bit of PTSD, you know, I'm driving by, I'm in my fifties. I drive by, I'm like, oh, that's a good bush to, to sleep in. Like the craziness that goes on in your head. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you're talking, look, this is not weird, right? If, if, you know, my, my sibling threw a, a rubber snake at me at five. There's no reason at 55 not to still, you know, twitch when you see a stick on the ground, right? Like this is, our brains are wired for survival. And oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm grateful for that. I, I think, you know, that's a super healthy thing, actually, that you would see that. And I, I'm sure you see that side too, but it is, it's a bizarre thing, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you're, your brain and your body are wired to protect you, you know, and my brain is still wired that if I am homeless, what do I do? I mean, it's, it's just the way that it is. And I mean, I laugh at it, but it's, but it did exist. So and you've done a wonderful job protecting yourself. I mean, goodness sakes. Um, I don't know that 16, I would have had the wherewithal to figure that out. Um, I slept one night away from home on a park bench because I was getting into trouble at 16. And I remember, I can still feel how cold that was, how uncomfortable it was, trying to make a newspaper blanket. And I'll tell you, after that night, I was like, you know what? This is not, like, this is not my future. And I can, I can feel that after literally one little stupid night. 
and you lived an entire season there and it's happened multiple times. Tell me about at 16, you're on the streets. I got to improve my situation. How can I get a job that's not working out? School, are you still trying to go to school or is that in the past? And tell me about kind of that that turning point of I got to fix this. I got to figure something out for myself. And it sounds like you kind of built a business almost out of necessity, out of survival. Tell us about the genesis of that. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, you know, my mother had my had conditioned and trained me to, to be a problem solver, not by choice, but because I had no other choice. Like this, this is your life. Go figure it out. And so problem solving was I learned it, obviously, but it was more of a natural like it became a habit. So the homeless thing where yes, it was crazy. And yes, it was scary. And yes, I was terrified was just one of the many other problem solving challenges that I had to deal with as a child. And so I never, and it sounds really bizarre, but I never hesitated. I'm like, all right, here we go. Let's do it. And so what does that look like? What do I need to do? Who do I need to call? What, what are the steps that I need to take? And so I never, ever considered getting, dropping out of school. That was never an option. It's like, okay, whether I'm stinky and have, you know, holes in my clothes, which thankfully, I don't think I did, but who knows, um, I'm still going to school. And, you know, I even had a call with the principal, not a call, but a, a meeting with the principal. And he's, and he, um, he said, well, you're homeless, you're going to have to go to a whatever, whatever those children are when they don't have a place to live. And I was like, Nope, not what I'm going to do. <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> he's like, what do you mean? I said, Anyway, that's a funny conversation, but my plan, finish school, get into college, and and part of that had to do with you can't work a full-time job and be in high school, right? This is just logistically impossible, So and they wouldn't let you legally, so I had to become a mathematic minor, and so I got all the court documents, and I literally, the last week of high school was my first week of college, and I, I graduated wow. high school. And which was nearly impossible because the school refused to let me. And I, so, you know, I know academically I'm pretty smart. So I'm like, look, you can't do this. This is the, this is the law. This is the page. And it doesn't matter what you want. I'm taking care of myself. This is what I'm doing. So I've had to, you know, I've had a lot of challenges with just getting what I want to get done because it's the best thing for me. So I graduated high school legitimately and started college and this is a funny side story. So I applied for financial aid in college and they denied it. And so I went to the financial aid department. I was like, I don't understand why you would deny me financial aid. Obviously, I don't have enough money to pay for if it. If there was ever someone, what's your house? Yes. Well, yes. zero. <laughs> zero. Yes. And so, <laughs> oh my and so oh they my God. said, this is the funniest thing. They said, no one could possibly, this is literally what she said, no one could possibly live on that income that you reported. Somebody must be helping you. It's probably your parents. I need their tax returns. And I said, listen, I, my dad is dead. My mother abandoned me. I am homeless. I don't have tax returns from her. And even if I did, she's not supporting me. I need financial aid. And they said, nope. <laughs> That is absurd. It is absurd. So I had to figure out not only not being homeless, but how to pay for college, which I knew that was what I wanted to do because I have goals. I have plans. I need this in my life. So, so I had a plan to figure begins, it out. So a plan begins to brew uh, exactly. in Andy's head. And what is that first plan? You're like, I'm going to go out there and make the money for college. What, what's the first thing that you did? What's the, what's the business that brewed in, in the teenage mind? Well, I had already had some experience in an office. I was a bookkeeper for, or had been a bookkeeper for a, a doc, a chiropractor. And I just have a lot of office experience and, and bookkeeping and numbers and everything. So I literally went door to door as a salesperson, like, hey, do you need any office help? Hey, do you need any office help? <laughs> like and you know I'm 16 so they're like excuse me and I finally ended up with this healthcare company healthcare administration company and they're like sure and I even remember her name was Linda and I and and she's like I do need help in fact and so she's like how does this work I'm like I don't know let's figure it out <laughs> so wow so and that then, was so my just, first just, gig and just door knock into business yes Absolutely. And I'm sure I looked just 
you know, questionable at best, right? You're homeless. I am still homeless at this time, by the way. How many door and, knock? How many doors do you think you had to knock? Um, oh my how, gosh! Tell tell us a little bit about the perseverance of. I don't have the education. I'm still homeless. I might not smell the way that they expect me to smell. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like you're really you're living this. Every odd is against you. Oh, absolutely. But you kept knocking on doors. Can you speak to that? What's your mindset like? What do you remember what you're saying to yourself? How I, how the heck do you get yourself? I can barely get my kid to go, you know, ask for a to-go cup at the restaurant, <laughs> right? And it's like he's so embarrassed. But you're out there door knocking with every single factor against you. How did you do that and what's the mindset like? You know, it's 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 I say that it's really weird because um, it never, ever, ever, ever occurred to me it wouldn't work. And whether from ignorance or hope or I don't have any choice, it was, it was, there's a part of me even now that it is what it is, right? You, you're just going to have to do whether you like it or not. And so, um, and that's been one of my saving graces, but there's, as you allude to, there's this piece, there's this part of you that is is whatever terrified or scared or or whatever well, all those negative things right but my i when i'm in the, when i am focused those thoughts never ever ever come into my mind i don't have time i don't have energy i'm not going to sit on the corner and cry because it's not useful energy right for me but at the end of the day, when I'm done knocking, that's when the demons come out. And that's where the fears come out. And that's when the, is this going to work come out? And that's when all of those, all of those other emotions come out, not when I'm doing it, but later on. And so those are like, okay, how many days is it going to, how many knocks is it going to take? Am I ever going to, to even get something? And, and then I always go back to, it doesn't matter. You're going to have to just keep doing it until it happens. And so for me, it was, you know, take one more step, take one more step, take one more step, because if you don't, nothing's going to happen, right? I think um, Michael Jordan was like, you know, if you don't take, if you don't take that one, you know, I can't remember how he says it, but it, I love it. It's, it's, oh, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. That's right. And so, and it's true, right? And anything in life is like that. It does not matter what it is, whether you're, you know, have marriage problems or financial problems or, it, you know, paying for school or anything. If you don't try, how is it ever going to happen? Right. That's so good. So now you're, you're working, doing admin and office work and help. Are you working for that company? And if, or kind of contracting to them, tell me about kind of the first, maybe the entrepreneurial idea or venture that you got into. And was that the one or was there other things? Tell me kind of a, the, what happened over the next few years as you started coming up with maybe ideas to, uh, is it improving your station in life or making more money or getting off the streets? How old are you when you finally get your own place and how did you accomplish that? So my first place I got, I shared with another girl, a 16 foot long trailer who, and she had a drug problem. <laughs> and so it was the only place I could find. No one could lease legally lease to a 16 year old and roommate situations were impossible because again, 16, right? Who wants to live with a 16 year old? Um, so it was really, really hard. And I ended up find, finding this girl and, um, and it was a blessing. It really was a blessing at that time. Like looking back, I think, oh my gosh, how did I do that? But at the time I'm not homeless. I'm safe. I'm relatively warm. And, um, and then the, you know, the, the entrepreneur part, it never, I didn't even know what that word was, by the way, at that time, I just knew I needed to, I needed to make money and I needed to you know, support myself. So I actually went to school, went to college full time, and I had a full time job. And I was rent creating a new business from the sense of, okay, knocking on more doors. And the reason I did that, because I still had to pay for college, right? And when as that grew to more clients, it was out of necessity for money. 
to be able to feed myself. And I, again, I don't have a car at the time. I don't have a driver's license. Everything's by bus. And so the first piece was just financial, which I think a lot of businesses kind of do, right? Especially now with, you know, um, with the pandemic. But eventually, along the same lines as the money piece, there was what I love to do. And I love to problem solve. I was good at it. And so that was one of the things that people really liked about me. They're like, look, we don't know where you come from, what you smell like, what you know, we don't know your situation. We just know you kick butt at what you do, whatever that is. If I tell you to do this, you have got it taken care of. And if you don't, you figure it out fast. You don't waste time. And like those, that was always fun for me. So the office stuff um, and bookkeeping, because I was great at numbers in general, which I ended up going to school for engineering and physics, but I didn't do that. But the next piece was everything that I knew could be better, I would improve. And so that turned into marketing that and back in the day before the internet, before the internet, because I'm so old, you know, it's just sounds so funny. Um, you know, I improved all of the marketing sheets, I had better language, I had better graphic design, I, you know, I improved processes and, pro and improvements at the companies that I worked for or with, and just everything was like, shiny, new and clean and better. Oh, always. And there, and you know, you're making $10 and well, no, that was, I made $3 an hour, I think at the time, but that's good money though. That was great money. I'm like, woohoo. And so like, I was all about making it better, making it faster, making it smarter, make, you know, saving your time, like just being a rock star. And people liked that and I was good at it. So it was never so much the entrepreneur and idea as much as I am a rock star and I'm going to prove it to you. And that was, you know, at that time it was a self-esteem issue because my mother abandoned me. I didn't have any, literally had zero family. Nobody was helping me. I had no friends still really. And this was my outlet. My outlet was my outlet to make myself feel good. You know, some people have drugs, some people have video games, some people have, you know, all of the things I had my business again, sounds weird, but that was just my outlet. And I got better and better and better and better at it. And you know, the ironic thing about all that was I was a horrible salesperson. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, may, it makes perfect sense too that. I mean, just like any other art or, or strategy there, there's the outlet for everybody. And um, from your story, it makes perfect sense that your outlet would be, I want to make things better. I want to improve it. And just like you were saying earlier, driving down the street today and you can say, oh, that would be a good bush. You're, oh, you're seeing the world from a different set of eyes and you're seeing the invisible, right? Things that people don't always see. Mm -hmm. And that translates into marketing and copy and everything else. You talk a lot about in, in your business today about understanding kind of the roadmap for strategic growth. And as we sort of wind down and uh, come to the, the back half of our time together, can you, what, what's, again, I guess, what, what's your take on, on what does strategic growth actually look like? What's something that as a business owner, maybe I'm not seeing that you can help me to see? What should I be focusing on? What might I potentially be missing? Yeah, it's such a big question. And I think it's so important because business owners usually get into business for two reasons. I find one out of necessity for finances or two, they have a passion. Usually they fall into one of those two categories. But when you start a business, you whether you recognize it or not, you're flying by the seat of your pants usually, right? I mean, it's just like, okay, I own a business. Now what? You need to get money. You need to get clients. And how do you do that? But it's still very like unclear, you know, as, as to what to do today and what to do tomorrow. And so having, we all say having goals is really important, which I agree with, but it's more than just having a goal. Like I'm really big on, okay, the analogy that I like to use is if you're driving from California to New York, what direction are you going to go? Well, that's east. And it's a direction that's wonderful and that's super important. But which route are you going to take? Are you going to go the north route through the country, the south route um, through the middle of the country on Route 40? How many hours are you going to drive? How much is it going to cost in gas? Where are you going to stop to, to um, rest? You know, all these questions. And, and even to the point where if you walk out of your house, get into your car, turn on your turn the car on, what are you going to do first? Are you going to back up? If you have a driveway, are you going to go straight and turn around? Are you going to, you know, I live in Southern California, so I can take route um, 57 or five or, you know, have a lot of options. What literally, what's your first step? 
right? And a lot of people don't know what that is. And it and that's just the first step. The first step is to know what steps you're going to take, which sounds a little redundant, obviously. But then what actions are you going to do to get there? So for example, with business, you know, I I had a, for example, I had an apparel company um, say, you know, we're doing business online. What should we do? Okay, well, there's a lot of questions around that. Do you want to be in brick and mortar? Do you want to be in in a, you know, the Walmarts of the world, or do you want to be a specialized boutique? Like there's all these business development questions that you can ask. And what, what's will... the process of, of kind of like, where do you start? Cause you, you've talked about that, you know, it's like, well, figuring out where you start, do you have kind of like, is there a system? Is there a, a way to do that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I, it, I hesitate because it sounds really scary at first, which is, know where you are now from the sense of your business. It's, and a lot of that for me, the strategic part is what does your business say on paper? I don't care how you feel about your business. I don't care who your client is. What does it look like on paper? That takes into account financial statements. It takes into account your customer base, like that is it your existing customer base. And what one of the things I do two things, but one of them is analytics. What does your business look like on paper with the, 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 the data, the black and white data? And how do we move it to its next level? So whether that's sales or number of customers or your all of the analytics that go into it. And that's not something that going to find in business school usually, which is a whole nother issue and conversation. But how do I, my big thing is education. If I can teach you how to strategically run your business without flying by the seat of your pants and be able to use those those tools and those, and those techniques year after year after year after year, then I'm doing a service. Like I, I am just, you don't know what you don't know, right? And how do you get the tools that are easy enough to understand and powerful enough to make an impact on your company? And that's my end goal. That's awesome. Well, I know you have some great tools for that too, and you're helping businesses and you've been doing that for 30 years now, uh, from the streets to a pretty darn successful life. Uh, Andy, you're an inspiration. And you have, I know you have like a, a, a webinar and you have a, an online course kind of all around the roadmap for strategic growth. Tell us a little bit about that and where can we get it and how can we follow you and, and where's, what's the best way to, to keep up with all things Andy? Oh, super fun. Yes, I love talking with people and connecting with people and answering questions. But the free one hour webinar is at Andy's freegift.com and Andy is with an IE. So it's A-N-D-I-E-S freegift.com. And that's understanding your roadmap to strategic growth, which is an overview of the things that will help you run your business better for tomorrow, right? This is for tomorrow and the future. And um, once you do that, you can also book a free strategy session. If you just want to talk and get some guidance, you know, do a little course correction or have specific questions. I always love connecting with people. And yes, so social media, I love because I can so answer so many questions and just give some guidance on a day-to-day -day basis. And Instagram is always the best place to start with me, which is andy.monet.ssd, which is the initials of my company, Strategic Solutions and Development. But yes, I always love connecting with people. Awesome. Well, that is great. Make sure you follow and connect with Andy. And then again, go to andysfreegift.com. A-N-D-I-E-S. There's no apostrophe because it's a web address. But go to andysfreegift.com and get a hold of the strategic blueprint. Uh, that is, well, it's a strategic, strategic blueprint and it's a webinar teaching about that. So that's very, very exciting. Andy, thank you for coming on and, and sharing your story and being so candid with us. And again, congratulations. I mean, truly, like, I know you are, you're a super humble woman, but I just want to say, Congratulations for what you've overcome. That's a big deal and you're crushing it. I'm so proud of you. That's awesome. Yeah, so kind and generous. Thank you, Matt. All right. Thanks so much, guys. That's the show for this week. Thanks for listening. Um, do reach out to Andy Monet, um, an incredible human being. And I, I know she would love to be able to help you in your business to share some strategic uh, vision. And, you know, again, you're going to get someone who sees things the way everyone else doesn't, you know, through her unique upbringing and unique story. That's sometimes the thing we need the most is, you know, not seeing the forest for the trees. And Andy can help you do that. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode, one of the things you can do to help the show the most is, yeah, you can leave a five-star review. That's awesome. 
I appreciate that. You can, and a lot of people have been doing that over on Apple Podcasts. You can certainly make sure you subscribe so you don't miss anything on demand. But the biggest thing you can do is when you're hanging out with a buddy or a friend, you know, today, tomorrow, just, you know, or even right now, you know, pop open the share on the on demand on Spotify, Apple, or Google Podcasts and share an episode. Share this episode, whatever one, and look in the archives. If there's an episode that really speaks to you um, and has helped you or is really interesting or made you laugh, take that one episode and share it with a friend and say, you got to check this one out. That is, we love growing the show literally one listener at a time. And that is you I'm talking to. So thank you for listening. I will see you next week. Another driven entrepreneur. Get out there and crush it. Bye for now.